You wouldn't be wrong in thinking that it wasn't very long ago that cars came from nothing but car companies. But over the past 10, 15, almost 20 years now, cars have come from other places, like technology companies, with mixed results. But what if we were to take some people from the tech world and some people from the car world, what would that result be? Okay, so first things first, what is this? Well, it's a Lucid, and one would think that's a car company that started about a year or two ago. In reality, it started when the guy who invented the first real whole Tesla, the Tesla Model S, he left and founded this company, which he now runs. He's also the chief technology officer. And then he brought on car people. Remember our old friend Derek Jenkins, who ran design at Mazda North America? He was one of the first like big hires over there. And then they subsequently brought over more car and tech world people to create this. And this is something that is different than a Tesla. It's different than a Mach-E. It's different than a Porsche Taycan in that the focus is efficiency through controlling all aspects of its design and construction. So think River Rouge like Ford back in the day. Well, not entirely. Like for example, the tires here are made by Pirelli. I'm sure there are many other examples like that. Really what they're focused on is designing, engineering, and manufacturing all the bits related to it being an electric vehicle. So yes, the batteries and the electric motors. Okay, so that's all fine and good, but how do you go about making something like this a reality aside from raising a ton of cash? Well, there's the obvious experience of designing, engineering, and building the Tesla Model S. Then there was the experience the likes of Derek brought to the table. People from the old car world, internal combustion engines, then they did something very unique. They did partnerships like with Formula E racing. They did the old school like smoky Unix thing where you learn from racing. Basically, you race on Sunday and I guess you sort of sell an EV on Monday. Now putting that disparate experience together does result in some advantages. Some are obvious and some are not quite as expected. Like for example, this is a five series car. And what they've done is made it on offer with multiple battery sizes. It starts with 92 kilowatt hours and goes all the way up to 118 kilowatt hours. This one, the Grand Touring, is a 112 kilowatt hour battery that's made up of 22 different modules. Now, why is that important? Those Hyundais we look at, even the Mercedes, like the EQE, which is about the same size as this car, uh, that has a much smaller battery. They range between 70 and 90 kilowatt hours. So the idea here is to have a car that has longer range. Now, they're talking, in some cases, up to 516 miles of range. This one with the bigger wheels and tires, 469 miles of range. Now, there are other advantages to designing, engineering, and building your own electric motors and your own batteries. One of them is packaging. You and I have looked at many other EVs that come from regular OEMs, and we always complain there's really no frunk. This not only has a frunk, it's actually got two frunks and it's not just this one here it's also in the back now this brings us to an obvious question why didn't they do an suv like all other car manufacturers because that's what everybody buys nowadays i don't have a good answer for that and frankly i'm glad they didn't because just look at this thing it's stunning to behold but i never like to tell you guys what you can see i'll leave that open to interpretation in the comments that said they are coming to market with an suv called the gravity anyway back to packaging here a flat trunk upon further investigation there is yet another large trunk behind the rear electric motor this car is all-wheel drive the most basic one they offer the pure that can be had as two-wheel drive then we get to something not so obvious you know how we spend a lot of time driving the Hyundais, the Kias, the Porsche, and the reason why I do that, 
frankly, they charge faster. Underpinning those is an 800 volt architecture. Why is that important? Well, when turning up to a charging station, let's say it has five chargers running at all the same speed, and you turn up with a car that has the same size battery, you will charge faster because the wiring throughout the vehicle is architected faster. This is the next logical step at over 900 volt architecture. Now, if we bring all of that together, one would assume this is not lightweight. That would be a correct assumption. 5,236 pounds, or depending on express your weights and measures, 2,375 kilograms. With that swift mode, which is the middle mode, and it's still quick. This is somewhere around in this mode, what a BMW M5 is. It's okay, so that's lovely and all, but not entirely surprising. As such, let's try a magic trick. And to do that, we need to deploy this secondary screen here. And you'll notice there's a smooth mode, which is the basic, the swift, we're in the middle area, and then sprint. Now, sprint really isn't a joke, so much so they ask you to confirm it here. And the best way to describe this is like a Taycan Turbo S. I've tried this before and it, it hurts your face. So with that, the things I do for you. This is quick. This is beyond M5, beyond M, Jesus, beyond M5 CS, and way beyond what we should be doing on this road. That said, this mode, all the stuff we discussed about how these guys have made all of their own bits, homegrown, and optimized it, this is where it pays dividends. The fact that it all kind of comes together. It isn't just how the torque comes from the motor. It isn't just that it's a smaller motor. It isn't just optimizing the wiring throughout the vehicle. All of this comes together to make a 5,300 pound vehicle go very quickly. It's kind of to the point that it's not expected. Is it to the point where it feels lighter than 5,200 pounds? No. And now we press on to an aspect that has clearly been influenced by the car industry side of the house. Why do I say that? Well, a couple of moving parts. First would be the overall design. The operative term here is open and airy, kind of like the Porsche 928 from back in the day in that the dash is so far forward and you will not be surprised to learn that Derek Jenkins, he is not only a huge Porsche aficionado, he used to run advanced design for Volkswagen Audi Group. Now that works in conjunction with this very novel glass canopy. It's not really a panoramic sunroof, it is the windscreen that goes from the base of the windscreen to behind the B pillar. And then there's the tactile feel and the color and trim. Otherworldly. This is the part that is magnificent about the interior. There are so many textures going on here, but not too many like in the third generation CTS. There's leather, there's suede or Alcantara, so fake suede, and then there's wool. And that's combined with the satin finish wood. And it not only feels right, it looks the part. And you really can't choose a color on the inside. You have to choose a theme. What you're looking at is Santa Cruz, which is a dark color on the front seats and a light color on the back seat. And then it brings in all of these details. There are others that are California in theme. They've got Tahoe and Mojave. And then speaking of California, after all this car was designed in California. So what Derek has done is they've incorporated the California flag, the bear, which you can kind of see here. And that is repeated as an Easter egg of sorts throughout the entire vehicle. Then getting in and out of the vehicle, there's a traditional key fob, but really not that traditional because there's no buttons on it. This is very much like a Tesla, no door lock buttons, no start switch. You just get into the car, hit drive and go. And then there's a card to open up the car and get into it. Basically, this you hold up to the B pillar, then again, get in the car, hit drive and go. Then there are some UX items that are interesting. We'll talk more about these later when we drive it. But one that I love, you can hide this secondary screen. That is such a lovely touch. But then there are some odd UX touches here. Like if I want to adjust the mirrors, 
I have to do that in the screen. May I make a suggestion here? The door panels as well as the window switches contained within the door panels are truly something to behold. So how about taking that as an opportunity to create a very unique, almost bespoke mirror controller that reinforces that this is an expensive luxury car. Now, there are other odd UX choices here, like for example, to control the steering wheel or some of the fine tune adjustments in the seat that's through the screen, even opening the glove box that is through the screen. However, other bits like the temperature control, the fan, the volume, they have these very chunky toggle switches and knurled knobs. There's a secret sauce and it's beyond all the stuff that Derek does because that's a certain kind of secret sauce. It's the driving dynamics. Now, why do I say that? Well, just look what we're doing. We're driving pretty aggressively in a large vehicle. Remember, this is the wheelbase of an M5 and we're doing it downhill. So this is not exactly the plane of motion we wanna be in. And the vehicle is relatively flat. Now, why is that important? This is about tuning. The engineers have chosen to go with coil springs and adjustable damper, so it's kind of old school. Think about that Porsche Taycan, whether it was a turbo or a turbo S we drove, what, two, three years ago now? Those, they don't understeer, they just don't steer. Like, if I push a turbo S in these kind of turns, I'm going there, because all of the weight that's underneath the vehicle, and this has a much larger battery than that, you would have no steering. Here, you don't even have understeer so much. Yeah, there's a limit where this thing, you just can't push it, but it's surprising how well this thing can track down the road. And maybe I'm letting a little geek fall out here, but they do it with old school engineering. Okay, so we already discussed that it has the faster 900 plus volt architecture, which translated is more lanes on a freeway for traffic to go through, thus making charging faster. Well, there's another trick up its sleeve, and that is one to two years of free charging on DC fast charging as well as level two charging on the Electrify America network. As you guys who have EVs know, these systems are frequently either broken, they don't have a credit card charging system on it, and it's very, very annoying to provision the charging. Here, at least Lucid tells me, all you gotta do is drive up with a car, plug it in, and it charges. This is the first time I am trying this, so we are doing this together. Uh, first, we release the door, and then we take the CCS here, I haven't pulled a charge plate out of my wallet, nothing. I don't even have the key fob for the car in my pocket. All I'm doing is I'm going to plug this in and hope for the best. Okay, it says initiating charging and it's making all of this noise here. Hopefully you can still hear me. Oh my God, it actually worked. The tech side of the house actually did something that works incredibly well. Think of this, this is like getting gas without pulling out a charge card to pay for it. The current charge speed is about 130 kilowatts and I've already gotten almost 18 kilowatts in seven minutes. So yes, this is fast, but before I dive into my charging time passing device, two points. Number one, this was delivered to me with 450 miles of range. Yes, 19 miles lower than the advertised range of this car with the 21 inch wheels. Now you and I, we've driven it very aggressively in the canyons, so you can't really expect the full efficiency of that range. But coming in here at about 200 miles of range left, this, it's legitimately more than a 300 mile range car, which most of the cars you and I test today are. Then the second point, everywhere I go with this thing, people come out of the woodworks for a sedan and they're like, oh my God, what is that thing? Or more interestingly, and I think maybe because I live in California, people come up to me thinking I own the car and they say, thank you for buying this because I own stock in Lucid. Now on the flip side of all of that, we need to have a discussion about the brakes. And here are two aspects. There's how they work in performance and they're around town work just fine. You don't feel like there's any deficit in and out of traffic. 
Around here, that's where we have a little bit of a problem. I feel like I want more braking in terms of pedal feel. It feels like a normal car. It's not like that of an M5 in terms of the way they feel, but there isn't that like on-off switch that I would fear in an electric car. Then allow me to geek out a bit. Remember when we drove that uh, Mercedes EQXX last summer in Germany, and they spend a lot of time fooling with the regen modes. And one of the things they do is they allow the car to coast more so it could be more efficient, and that's how they get more range. These guys do something very novel. Uh, the brake pads sit farther away from the brake rotors, which enable the car to coast more efficiently. It's one of those many aspects that go into increasing the efficiency of the car so they can get these high ranges, like in this case, almost 470 miles. Now, is that playing into the brake performance? That we'll have to have a discussion with the engineer who actually designed them. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game on the options game with today's contestant, something that is proudly made in the Grand Canyon State Forkham Devils, the Lucid Air Grand Touring. Now, pricing on these is somewhat confusing because there are many different models. They start with the Pure, which is the two-wheel drive, and that one has a metal roof. It doesn't have this glass canopy. That one's $87,400. And then the top of the range is the Sapphire, which is like the ridiculous, like plaid competitor, super fast. That one's gonna be 250 grand. But back down to earth, there is a Touring, which is all wheel drive. That's $107,000. Then there's this one, the Grand Touring base price, $138,000. Most of the colors, they don't charge extra for. Now this gray I'm not entirely offended by because of some of the trim details, like for example, the aluminum around the front, as well as the aluminum on the roof, all the way to the C pillar. They call that the platinum package. They're doing a gray one, of course. They call that stealth. That's an additional $6,000 I wouldn't pay for. And it's funny, I've only seen these in white, gray, and beige. How about some other colors? Then we press on to the first option, which are those 21 inch wheels, which do have a huge impact on the range. 469 like this. If it didn't have these wheels, 516, and we do pay $2,000 for that. Then level two autonomy, which really is not the case here. This isn't one of these things where you can take your hands off the wheel. It will keep it in the lane, but they haven't released the full level two autonomy. So this is 10 grand for ADAS. Then we press on to the surround sound system. Optional on a $138,000 car, $4,000, which brings us to a total retail price of $154,000 even. Okay, so let's you and I slow down, put aside everything we just discussed and focus on usability. Now when I say usability, what exactly do I mean? That's one's daily interaction with the vehicle, in this case, a lot to do with the UX. Because if I'm honest, my last experience with this thing, it wasn't great. It wasn't ready for prime time. It wasn't even ready to be called a beta. That was an alpha at best. There were issues with the speed, the interaction with the vehicle. There's a lot of things that weren't supported. In this version, they say it's speedier in terms of dealing with the UX. I'm not seeing a huge difference, like transitioning between applications is not particularly quick. Uh, then there's some things that have been troublesome. Like for example, I've got to bring this screen down here and I've got to say, I love this design feature, but that aside, connectivity. Someone's gonna buy any car nowadays, whether it's this at 154 grand or a $20,000 Maverick, you wanna connect your phone. Here, they still don't have any support for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And you know, I live the startup life, I get it. You have a prioritization list here, dealing with the likes of Google and Apple, probably troublesome in their early years, but they do say they're gonna change that. However, I still want Bluetooth connectivity, right? Well, I go here, I go here, okay? And you see it's on the Bluetooth screen. But if I try to go to any other screen, this one is frozen. So basically this is the settings screen and this entire application is frozen that has been frozen since the first time I got in the car to set up my phone to work with the vehicle. I've 
gone away from the vehicle, had it lock itself. I spent like an hour away, I came back and it's still this. Put another way, this is where Lucid needs to focus. This is the last frontier, or really should say the next frontier for the company. Okay, so what have we learned today? Well, the combination of Silicon Valley and Detroit works better than expected. In all the areas of it being a car, including the EV bits and its architecture, it exceeds most others. Where it falls down is the surprising part, all the stuff that Silicon Valley should be very good at. And this is where we get to the wish list. I would strongly suggest a theme of less complicated, meaning like regular door handles, a UX that is well sorted before you ship it. That's how it works maybe with phones and televisions and tablets, but a vehicle that's 5,200 pounds, it needs to be well sorted from the factory, from the drop, and that we can't negotiate. So perhaps in other versions of the Lucid Air or the coming Gravity, or perhaps less expensive versions of Lucid's in the future, let's bring about less complexity. But I'm just one man, and this is the point of the episode where I turn this around to you to opine in the comments below, or via our social media, Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, if you got value out of this episode, I would greatly appreciate you sharing these episodes with all your friends on your socials. Till I see you in the next episode, bish beta.